some tremendous passages, uh, passages, messages on Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And I mentioned in college, it seemed like uh, that would have been one of the most popular passages, preachers coming through, that would just give it to us. And uh, it was tremendous, the messages that I heard from these passages. And I'm sure over the years, you have also heard it starts out, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. We mentioned the mercies of God are displayed through all the previous chapters, um, all the wonderful doctrines of salvation, justification, reconciliation, and on, on, and on. Um, and because these wonderful mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And we said that uh, chapters 1 through 11 of Romans gives us doctrine Chapters 12 through 16 gives us duty. And now we have on the wall out here, these verses, the Christian's duty. Well, the Christian's duty is doing the will of God. You know, you get all stirred up about being a living sacrifice, and you say, I am presenting myself unto God, holy, you know, acceptable unto God. I'm a, living, I'm a living sacrifice unto God. Now what do I do? Now what do I do? Well, what, what you do is spelled out right here. At first, this passage uh, just reminds us. I like a quote from Matthew Henry on this passage. He said, the best and most useful man in the world is no more, no better than what the free grace of God makes him every day. And before God spells out in this passage our duty as Christians, and it starts out we already looked at uh, those that are in leadership positions um, and how they're just to draw on the grace of God. Um, before it spells out these duties, it tells us that it's just through the grace of God. Verse 3, for I say therefore, I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. And we serve the Lord through faith in him, and without faith it is impossible to please him. And we are, uh, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Heaven then gifts different according to the grace that is given to us. Whatever you do, however the Lord's called you to serve him, it's through the grace that he's given to you, given to us. And he says, well, the prophecy, let us prophesy according to the portion of faith. And you just preach according to faith in God's word. And or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. Just do what God has called you to do. Be faithful to it. If you're a living sacrifice, then do what God wants you to do. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. And there are those that God has gifted in that area of giving. And just go to it. Just uh, with simplicity. Uh, no ulterior motives. You know, sometimes you hear stories of some big giver. And they're doing it to try to control things. 
Uh, God said, just do it with simplicity, just because you love the Lord. You love the Lord. You have a single heart towards the Lord. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. We mentioned how showing mercy can be, when you, when you get out, I mentioned this illustration with bus kids and see some of the broken homes and problems and difficulties. It can be heartbreaking, but do it with cheerfulness, just a joy to show the love of the Lord Jesus. And then we get into a whole bunch of duties. These are duties for the Christian. This is the will of God. This, is a, this isn't just uh, like going to the salad bar and saying, well, I like this, I don't like that, that looks yummy, you know, uh, I'll try a little bit of this. This is, we are to be living sacrifices unto God, and we are to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And that will of God is for us to serve him. And this is just given a summary of, of uh, what the Christian should be busy doing in serving the Lord. And it starts out, let love be without dissimulation. Let love be, and if for a Christian, it's showing the love of God. The love of God. And God's love is perfect. And that word dissimulation means hypocrisy. And if we're going to show the love of the Lord, it is going to be, the love should be without hypocrisy. I mean, you truly love people. And no being a phony. Uh, no, um, they say the difference between being up north and being south sometime. So the south, the south is the Bible about uh, everybody. So many, so many just say they're Christian, they go with the flow. And sometimes you'll meet somebody, if you've been in the south, uh, they will be just dripping with loviness. And, and in the long run, you find out, well, they really don't like me. And. Up in Maine, you'll find out right away they don't like you. <laughs> but we're to love, we are to love without dissimulation, without hypocrisy. And look at 1 Corinthians, that great love chapter. 1 Corinthians 13. There were teachers in the church at Corinth that I uh, thought they were so knowledgeable. They knew more than Paul. They were better than Paul. And Paul, uh, wasn't. they didn't even think he was an apostle, and they doubted him, and he wasn't eloquent. He wasn't flashy. Uh, he wasn't what they thought a, you know, a teacher should be, a preacher should be. And uh, Paul says, you know, you teachers, you, he's, he's hitting these, once in Corinth, and saying that, you know, you, you might be a great speaker and all the, you might give and do all these things, but you're not very loving. Not very loving. It says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and, ha and Paul graciously applies it to himself, but you know that there were uh, those, that segment that was against Paul, and always fighting against Paul. Uh, Paul knows this is true for himself. He says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Just a, like a gong and annoying. Like I had to get up one night and the wind was blowing so hard. This is when uh, my sweetie was in Florida. We had this wind blowing so hard. And I had to get up in the middle of the night and take down the chimes, those chimes, <laughs> just like they were slapping against the wall instead of just, 
And without love, it gets pretty, it's annoying. It doesn't matter, doesn't matter how great a speaker may be. And it says, though I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Does that mean that love is more important than doctrine? Well, Paul just spent 11 chapters in Romans talking about doctrine before he says, let love be without dissimulation. Doctrine is our basis for love. How does God love us? How could God forgive us? This free gift of salvation, uh, our doctrine is our basis for uh, true love. True love is based in true doctrine. And I just read, I was reading a little devotional that came up on my phone, and the devotional said that uh, more important than doctrine is how we love others. Is that true? No. No. That's, that's just the way uh, the devil deceives us. Well, how important it is, is it that we love others? Well, it's important as the doctrine that says we ought to love others. That's how important it is. And if you try to separate it from doctrine, then you're going to make everything else crumble. Uh, Paul here says that, you know, if I had all knowledge and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, well, wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be love? Well, not always. Sometimes it is like the Pharisees that would blow their trumpets and say, well, I'm get, look at what I'm doing. And though I give my body to be burned. And some people are just uh, stubborn and they're not acting out of love. It's, and Paul says, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. And there were false teachers or at least teachers that were going against Paul in the church at Corinth, and their love was not without dissimulation. They um, had some problems. And God tells us, let love be without dissimulation, without hypocrisy. Abhor that which is evil. Abhor that. So we are to love, and we are just to love as God loved, we are to love, well, as it goes down, uh, verse 10, we'll see, uh, with all our hearts, we are to love, but we are also to hate. Hate. Do you hate? You don't hear many messages on hate. You need to hate. But it's in the Bible to hate that which is evil. Abhor. That word abhor, just uh, if you have horse on the site, uh, it's uh, um, you're just horrified at the thought of uh, that evil. Uh, the Bible tells us, ye that love the Lord, hate evil. Look in Psalm 119. And verse 104, through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. We need Christians to be more hateful. We, we, we just need Christians to be more hateful of that which is wrong. But we're not talking, we're talking about the false teaching, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You know what? You've got to love people. you got to love people like the Lord loved them, but you hate every false way. Abhor that which is evil. Then it says, 
cleave to that which is good. And the word there, cleave, is like to be glued to. Just be glued to that which is good. You are not going to forsake that which is good. The same word cleave is used of marriage. Look in Matthew chapter 19. Jesus said, and well, let's start in verse 4. He answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Well, if the Lord asks that question today, most of the world would have to say, No, we haven't read that. Or we don't believe that, or we don't understand that. Verse 5, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh, but he is to cleave. Wherefore, they shall be no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. But the cleave is to be glued to. We want to be glued to that which is good. We're not going to give it up. Then, verse 10 says, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. Brotherly love. We were just looking at brotherly love uh, a few weeks ago when we looked at the, the message of the church at Philadelphia, which Philadelphia means brotherly love. And God help us to have that brotherly love. The way this is put, this is beautiful, the way the Lord puts this. It's uh, be kindly affectioned one to another, with brotherly love. It's just beautiful the way the Lord's put that. And this says, if you, if you say you are a living sacrifice to the Lord, if you say, I am consecrated to him, I'm dedicated to him, uh, I laid my life down, he laid his life down for me, I'm giving my life for him to serve him, then you are to be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. And just something that uh, we want to work on. Just something we always want to be improving and growing. And this um, makes me think of Jonathan and David. If you turn to 1 Samuel chapter 18. Oh, I'm in 2 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 18. And Jonathan, he must have admired David for standing against Goliath. And he probably saw, saw David there standing with the head of the Philistine. And in... First Samuel 18, it says, And it came to pass, when he had made an end to speak unto Saul, that is what David was speaking with Saul, and you just see the courage and that, that excellent spirit that David had as a young man that loved the Lord. It says, The soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. Um, God just help us to love one another like brothers and sisters, uh, to, uh, to know people, to worship together with people, study God's word together with people, sing God's praises together with people that love the Lord Jesus. People that love the Lord Jesus, uh, we ought to be just kindly affectioned towards one another. Uh, like Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And, it said, and Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. 
Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. Jonathan just was so good to David. And God help us to be uh, so good to one another, to love one another. You hear stories. You hear stories of Christians fighting or uh, problems in churches. And we know, you know, we want to blame the devil. The devil's always at work trying to stir up strife and hatred and cause divisions uh, in in the local church, and uh, God help us just to have a love that uh, covers the multitude of sins and be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. And then it says, in honor, preferring one another. In honor, preferring one another. I believe as you go on and you read about David and Saul. David and Saul. How could David be so good to Saul? Uh, you know, David had a chance. His Saul chased him, kept chasing him, chasing him, wanted to kill him. Saul just hated David, and David was good to that man, and. You can look in First Samuel. I should have kept. We should have kept our finger in First Samuel. Go back to First Samuel, eighteen. Samuel's attitude when he says to Saul and. 1 Samuel 18, 18, David said unto Saul, Who am I, and what is my life, or my father's family in Israel, that I should be son-in-law to the king? He just had this idea of Saul. He, put, he preferred Saul over himself. He just had that attitude of respecting others and esteeming others and if you look in down in verse 22, Saul commanded his servants, saying, Commune with David secretly and say, Behold, the king hath delight in thee. This is what we call uh, love being with dissimulation. It was phony. Uh, Saul exhibited a, a phony, hip, hypocritical love. It wasn't love. Commune with David secretly and say, Behold, the king hath delight in thee, and all his servants love thee. Now therefore be the king's son-in-law. And Saul's servant spake those words in the ears of David. And David said, Seemeth it to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law, seeing that I am a poor man and lightly esteemed? And the servants of Saul told him, saying, On this manner David spake. Saul said, Thus shall ye say to David, The king desireth not any dowry. No, the king is being so gracious. He doesn't want any dowry. But a hundred foreskins of the Philistines to be avenged of the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. When his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law, and the days were not expired. Wherefore David arose and went, he and his men, and slew the Philistines two hundred men. And David brought their foreskins, and they gave them in full tale to the king, that he might be the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him Michael, his daughter, to wife. And just how amazing man that David was, that in honor he preferred Saul over his, his own self. And look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. See, I told you we might not make it all the way through these verses. Philippians chapter 2. It tells us in verse 3, 
Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. You should just treat others better than your own self. You hold them up higher than your own self. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Just always trying to help others and take care of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And the Lord Jesus is the supreme example in esteeming others as he went to the cross for us. And so our duty, our duty as believers in the Lord, our Christian duty as displayed on the wall out here is in honor, preferring one another. Then it says, not slothful in business. Not slothful in business. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. That uh, not slothful in business, in the context here, it's talking about uh, the business of serving the Lord. Jesus said, I must be about my Father's business. And just to be um, busy as can be, serving the Lord. And I knew when I was in high school, there was a young man that you, could, you wouldn't find a harder worker. I mean, uh, I would say he must be a millionaire today. He, just worked, he tried to hire me as one of his workers when I was in high school. And this guy was not slothful in business. He was working like crazy all the time. But I guess he wouldn't come to church. He was out of church for years and years and years. Um, he was not slothful in business for himself. But Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. Just um, putting the Lord first in, in, in everything we do. Um, not slothful in business. And then fervent in spirit and zeal. There was a verse I missed this morning. Well, I didn't, I didn't comment on. Uh, in Revelation, the church at Laodicea. Turn over, turn back to the church at Laodicea. This would be, we can make this the last, last comment. When it says fervent in spirit, here the church at Laodicea was lukewarm. And verse 19, the Lord Jesus says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. God is going to put us through chastening to try to get us to be on fire for him. Just to follow him with all our hearts. And then he says, Be zealous. Be zealous, therefore. That is the opposite. To be zealous, that's the opposite of that lukewarmness. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Just to have zeal. Jesus said, the zeal of my father's house hath eaten me up. And we are to be fervent in spirit and serving the Lord. We will stop right there. And let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for a good day in your house with your people. And i just so thankful for your word, how good your word is. And pray that you help us to keep growing in your love and uh, to be more like the Lord Jesus. And pray that you help us in all these areas that we've looked at. Pray for uh, Jack and Nicole, that uh, you would be close to them, and for uh, any tests that Nicole has to go through this week, uh, doctor's appointments, uh, that you'd be with her. And pray for the Coburn family, that you would comfort them and help them. And pray for uh, Amy and the kids, that they would be feeling better. And I pray for 
uh, Bob and Emily. Pray that you comfort them with the uh, loss of Bob's sister. And uh, so many others we're praying for. Just pray that you be with each one. And pray that uh, this week, that we, as we do the windows, that it would go really well. And it will be a sweet time of fellowship. And just help us as we serve you this week. In Jesus' name, amen.